I'm glad you all were able to make it here tonight. My name is Rose Jansen. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we are partnering with the St. Louis Zoo on this conservation conversation. So we're very pleased to be here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, I'm going to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about who we are. We're actually the St. Louis Science Center's parent organization, although we are, we are a separate nonprofit. We've been around since 1856, and it's our mission to promote the public understanding of science. And we do that through a number of venues and initiatives. We have a number of science seminar series, trips and tours throughout the region, and you can find more information on our events. I left some literature for you to take with you tonight on the visitor's desk outside the auditorium. So feel free to pick up any of that. Um, we also will have some sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. So if you have an interest in finding out more about our free public seminar series and other offerings of the Academy and the St. Louis Zoo as well, you can fill that out and we won't share your name with any other organizations. Uh, we'll also have stickers outside on the visitor's desk uh, at the end of the presentation for any students who need to verify their attendance tonight. Uh, we have just up and coming very quickly we have, uh, in February, if you have an interest, we have a seminar with uh, OASIS, the Quest for Cures, Stem Cells and Childhood Conditions. That's on February 10th. Also on February 10th, that's in the morning. In the evening, we have Citizen Science from the Cosmos to Coneflowers, the story of how ordinary people are enabling large-scale discovery. And that's here at the St. Louis Zoo at 7.30. It's free and open to all. Uh, that's with Pamela Gay. She's an astronomer and assistant research professor with Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and she's the co-host of Astronomy Cast and a team member of Galaxy Zoo. Uh, then we have on February the 11th an energy issues panel discussion. That's at Kirkwood High School. There's more information on that also on the desk outside. Uh, we have uh, Richard Axelbaum from uh, Washington University. He'll be talking about clean energy opportunities and challenges for Team Biswas. He'll be talking also from Washington University. He'll be talking about our environment and development and what Washington University is doing in terms of alternative fuels and energy. Uh, environmental economics uh, with Lee uh, Kosnick. She's with uh, St. Louis University. She's an environmental economist. And then James McLaren, who is the founder and president of Strathcurrent Inc., which is a biotech and bioenergy consulting company focused on the future. He'll be talking about energy and how that, how that works in terms of our, our world. Uh, and then on February the 16th, Tuesday, February the 16th, another conservation conversation, Bring Out Your Dead, Undertaking Conservation, the Recovery of the Endangered American Bering Beetle. That's with Bob Mers, Zoological Manager of Invertebrates here at the St. Louis Zoo. Um, with that said, I'm going to let Jim Jordan introduce tonight's speaker. And there's another conservation conversation in April. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that. And uh, thank you very much. It's nice to see such a large crowd here tonight. I'm curious, how many people heard about this on KWMU as a radio spot? Okay. How about in the Post-Dispatch? Okay, a few more. Those are some other promotional venues that are picking up on this series. And how many of you are zoo friends? Yeah, the majority. Look at that. Great. Um, so two weekends ago, I was out in Mizzou and kind of solidified a very, very exciting opportunity for us. Um, global legal trade of animals amounts to 15 billion to 55 billion a year. Global illegal wildlife tra trafficking is worth 20 billion a year. It's the second largest uh, if you will, black market or illegal uh, economic boon in the U.S. right behind drugs. And we're bringing in Laurel Neen, who is an uh, environmental journalist, and she's just written a book, Animal Investigators, How the World's First Wildlife Forensic Lab is Solving Crimes and Saving Endangered Species. 
the real CSI of the animal world. So it'll be titled ASI, Animal Scenes Investigation. And just quickly, um, to give you a little bit, in Oregon, she discusses the founding of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory, the first and only animal forensics laboratory known as the CSI of wildlife, and brings the trafficking of Alaska walruses, black bear, gallbladders, and feather art to life. Uh, she's had a chance to interview a number of the uh, players there, and the, the stories should be wonderful. So we encourage you, and we'll be sending out an e-card announcing this, because it isn't on the flyer, but we encourage you to come April 13th and come early. I'll guarantee we'll be turning people away for that talk. There'll be lots of high school students that'll be here and interested. Okay, so with that, moving on to tonight's program. Steve Bircher has been with the zoo now for 32 years. He started out in the children's zoo and worked his way through various animal division uh, areas as a keeper, and then was up at the commissary for four years and was assistant curator for mammals. And then since 1989, he's been the curator of carnivores. Steve has been involved in a lot of AZA conservation programs, particularly SSPs with all of the cats or felids, all of the bear SSPs at one time or another, and has served as a consultant for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on various tasks. Steve has been involved with polar bear conservation in the past, and currently at our St. Louis Zoo, he's the principal head for the Cheetah Conservation Center, which is one of our wild care centers. So Steve's going to talk to us tonight about the Cheetah Conservation Center that has changed a little bit in focus over the last few years. And, you know, I think all of us would like to go there and see that cheetah. So with that, I'll introduce Steve. Thank you, Jim. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I just wanted to add my thank you to all of you for coming out tonight because I know it's a cold winter evening and we have a great turnout tonight. And I usually like to start my talks on cheetahs by telling you um, how lucky I have been to work with a magnificent animal, the cheetah, for most of my career. 30 years of my career, I've had the opportunity to work with, with cheetahs, not just cheetahs. I also have the opportunity to work with a number of different uh, large carnivores. Actually, I've worked with everything from elephants to guinea pigs here at the zoo over my 30-year career. But, um, but the cheetah is a very special cat. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about tonight. And I have a tendency to talk quite a bit, and I'll try to get everything in and make this enjoyable for you this evening. Um, why is the cheetah so special? Well, the cheetah is special because it's designed, everything you see on a cheetah is designed for speed. It's long streamlined body, long legs, the long tail, small head, it's got large nasal bronchial passageways to bring in a lot of air. They have non semi-retractable claws, which are an adaptation for running. And cheetahs are the fastest land mammal in the world. They're capable of running speeds up to 70 miles per hour. But they're also racing towards extinction. And, and there are a number of threats today facing cheetahs in the wild. And those threats include human cheetah conflict, loss of habitat and fragmentation, um, poaching and indiscriminate killing by ranchers, uh, competition with large carnivores, and lack of genetic diversity. <clears throat> And if we look at this range map of cheetahs, uh, it's very telling because in the early 1900s, the early 20th century, um, cheetahs ranged over most of the African continent. If you look at the lighter color pink, you can see that they range from the western side of Africa all the way over to the eastern side of India to Asia Minor. And then um, you can see how today, the population has really decreased. Uh, there's areas of low density. Cheetahs are still found in uh, northern Africa. There are a few scattered populations of cheetahs. And the majority of cheetahs today are found mainly in East Africa 
South Africa, uh, Southern Africa. But the red uh, indicates where the majority of cheetahs are found today. And uh, we estimate today probably somewhere between eight and 12,000 cheetahs left in the wild today. So if you consider that there were 100,000 cheetahs about 110 years ago, that population has been declining by 10,000 cheetahs every decade, that it doesn't look real good. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we uh, decided to focus on the cheetah as one of our conservation wild care centers uh, in 2003, 2004. Um, normally, cheetahs live a solitary lifestyle. So if you're lucky enough to travel to Africa, most of the cheetahs that you see will probably be single animals, but you may come across uh, a mother, a family group. Uh, if you do see a group of cheetahs, and it's typically a mother with young, they'll stay with the mother 18 to 24 months. You'll also find coalitions, male coalitions of cheetahs. And we're now learning that there are a lot of advantages to animals living in groups like this. Male coalitions usually consist of two to five male cheetahs, and there are a lot of advantages to living in a coalition uh, group. They can maintain and retain larger areas. They can defend those areas, uh, those territories more easily. Uh, they can bring down uh, larger prey. The primary prey for cheetahs is the Thompson gazelle. They're opportunistic feeders. They'll take all kinds of mammals, uh, birds, small mammals, and that. But their primary food is the Thompson gazelle. <coughs> However, when they live in these coalitions, these family groups or these groups of males, uh, they can bring down larger prey, like a wildebeest. Um, I mentioned the fact that uh, the cheetahs are fighting for their survival in the wild. And um, there are two reasons why this is happening. One is the fact that cheetahs are really at the bottom of the pecking order. If you look at the other large carnivores, that are found within their environment. It includes the lion, the leopard, African wild dogs, hyena. And cheetahs are having a hard time competing against those animals. And all of them, except for excluding the leopard, the three on the left side here, those three large carnivores, are social carnivores. They live in groups. And as I said before, there are a lot of advantages to living in a group. Um, you can defend a larger territory. If you have females that are all, all become pregnant at the same time, they're all lactating, you can have one animal, one mother stay back and nurse the young when the other animals can go out to hunt. Um, there, so there are a lot of really good advantages to, having, uh, to living in a, in a social group. Um, with cheetahs, however, oftentimes a mother cheetah who has to raise her offspring by herself, once the babies are born, she'll leave those in a den area She'll go out to hunt, and oftentimes those cubs are found by lions, hyenas, African wild dogs. Uh, they'll kill them. They don't always eat them, but they consider them competition for food. So in one area of the Serengeti, we learned this back in the 80s. Dr. Tim Carroll, who was studying cheetahs there, and now Sarah Durant, who's one of my research colleagues, uh, they learned in the Serengeti that 94% of the cheetah cubs don't survive their first year. That's an extremely high number of uh, mortality. Um, so you can see that cheetahs really are having some problems. The other side of that issue is that in the national parks, or the protected areas at least, uh, you'll find higher numbers of lions and leopards and, and hyenas because this is what tourists want to see. They want to see cheetahs, but they also want to see those other large carnivores. So that's not helping the situation. So you have abnormally high numbers of these other large carnivores, and they're out-competing uh, cheetahs. <clears throat> he doesn't look like much of a threat uh, to cheetahs, but, um, but the lions do do their share of damage. Um, it's interesting, though, because when you look at cheetah mortality, we used to think that mostly it was from the other large carnivores. But we've now learned that most of the cheetahs today are killed by other cheetahs, mainly males. Male cheetahs are killing other cheetahs. And that's the highest form of, of uh, mortality today. Um, so that's, that's a difficult thing. <clears throat> now I want to go back a little bit and tell you a little bit about our history of cheetahs here at the St. Louis Zoo. 
And I know a lot of you have grown up here at the zoo like I have, so you're familiar with some of these things. But these slides are a little bit out of focus because a lot of these pictures that I've taken, these slides were scanned. They were taken 20 years ago or over 20 years ago. Um, we've had cheetahs in our collection here at the zoo for oh, many years, going back into the 20s and the 30s, the old lion house. Um, but the zoo really didn't become serious or make a commitment to cheetah conservation until the mid-70s. In 1974, the zoo constructed the Cheetah Survival Center. And it was an interesting concept because it was different than the way Big Cat Country was designed. Big Cat Country was designed the old building and the new building. Most of your big cats all live within that one building or that one area. We knew that from cheetah behavior in the wild, the cheetahs are stressed or intimidated by other large carnivores. So it was designed at the far opposite end of the zoo, away from the other large carnivores. And, um, and that was kind of a neat thing to, to, uh, to build this facility at that, at that, a that area. Um, the thing is, though, about cheetahs is that when we first started keeping cheetahs, we were keeping cheetahs together as pairs. And that's the way we keep the other large cats, lions, tigers, leopards. And um, they're fairly prolific. But with cheetahs, we know that if you keep cheetahs in a pair, male and female, and you keep them together all the time, it's probably not going to result in successful breeding. And we believe that what happens is oftentimes the, couples, uh, the, the female becomes uh, complacent. Both of them become complacent. And the female stops cycling, and then you get no reproduction. That's not the way they live in the wild. Cheetahs are typically solitary in the wild. Males and females don't live together. So, um, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but what we learned was that putting these males and females together, they don't always like each other. So you're familiar with our SSP programs, our species survival plans. They're cooperative breeding efforts. One zoo can't maintain an entire population of a cheetah. But if we pool the resources of a group of zoos, we can then maintain limited size populations, anywhere from 50 up to about 300 individuals. And then by managing the genetics and demographics, we can maintain a genetic reserve. And that's kind of the way we do it. Um, but what we learned with cheetahs is that when you put a male and female together, they don't always like each other. And so when we make these recommendations on paper, and we have geneticists who actually analyze the population, they can come up with what are called mean kinship numbers, uh, inbreeding coefficients, we used to call it. It's really how closely related individuals are to one another and how well represented they are in the population. Um, and as I said, it all looks good on paper. So when we meet once a year, we master plan, cheetahs, tigers, whatever it may be, um, we try to select the animals that have the lowest mean kinship numbers for breeding. And we transfer those animals, and then we try to put them together. Well, we also learned that with cheetahs, they have a very, very strong mate preference, uh, compatibility factor. It's not a whole lot different than humans, or birds, or a lot of animals. They're very picky, or very selective in their mates. It's really interesting because the cheetah population, um, <laughs> only about 15% of the cheetah population in the world, not just in North America, the captive population has reproduced. That's just the opposite of all the other large uh, cats, about 85%. Most of them are very prolific. Cheetahs are not. So what we did, I'm saying we, the cheetah SSP, we needed to look at the cheetah's biology. We needed to look at all aspects of the cheetah's biology. And we began a, a research study of cheetahs back in the early 80s. And we started looking at all these different areas. We looked at uh, physiology. We looked at reproductive biology. We looked at nutrition. We looked at behavior. We know how cheetahs live in the wild. Um, and we tried to apply that to cheetahs in, in our zoos. Um, so we had different students. This was a research student um, who worked here. And she did her honors thesis at uh, Washington University. And she ended up actually, after she did this study here and she graduated uh, WashU, she moved to Namibia. And she helped develop the first education program for Laurie Marker, who's a very well-known uh, cheetah researcher and uh, a longtime friend of mine. Um, but so we were looking at behavior. Um, we also, well, this was an animal that was, is being palpated right here uh, for pregnancy. Uh, we had a group of cheetahs here at the St. Louis Zoo. We were kind of 
I should say fortunate. Um, we had a group of about a dozen cheetahs, well, 14 total, that, uh, that had to be hand raised. And they were hand raised not because we want to hand raise our young animals, uh, because we had no choice. We had a disease that was uh, carried through our population, uh, feline herpes. And the disease was being passed, we believe, from the dam to the cubs. So what we were able to do was pull the cubs at a very young age. We'd keep them with the mother for the first three to four days so they'd receive colostrum from the mother. Then we would pull those cubs before their eyes opened so that we could raise those animals. They would imprint on us, which isn't always great. But it was much easier for us to raise those animals at that point. Well, because of that, when these animals grew up and became adults, we had tractable cats. So we were able to go in with these cats and do all kinds of things with our cheetahs at that time, which you can't do with a mother-raised cat or a wild cheetah. Uh, palpating is one thing. Um, we also uh, embarked on a, a radio telemetry study here. We were one of the first zoos to do this with cheetahs uh, in a zoo. We placed a radio telemetry collar on our female cheetahs, well, males too, and we were measuring or monitoring activity level because what we thought was that when cheetahs come into estrus, when it's breeding season, you're going to see an increase in activity. So these collars had a little mercury switch that when the animal got up and moved, it would signal, send a signal into our equipment inside the building. This is Sherry Asa and one of her assistants here that were monitoring um, the radio telemetry inf uh, uh, information that was coming in. We also placed uh, body temperature implants inside of the cats and it was like a half bar of soap and it was another monitor that measured uh, changes in body temperature because we know that most female mammals that when that female ovulates uh, that there should be an increase in body temperature so if we monitor that over a long enough period we should see these increases and see fluctuations and that we hope would correlate to estrus and um, then, when we saw this on a graph or a chart, we could then say, okay, this is the optimum time to introduce our female to our male. And that's when males and females come together in the wild. So we tried that. And this particular study, though, um, it was really good at monitoring body temperature, especially when we were doing an anesthesia, uh, to monitor that throughout the anesthesia. But it wasn't real good with activity because it was skewed by all the other radio interference around the city and this was 20 years ago so that the collars and the technology is much better today than it was 20 years ago. But at least we tried it. And we had some natural breeding too. So, um, you know, the, when Stephen O'Brien did his study and looked at cheetahs um, and compared cheetahs to the other large cats Stephen O'Brien and his team theorized that the reason why cheetahs don't breed well in the wild or in captivity, they believed, was because cheetahs had gone through population bottlenecks in the past and that when the population had dropped to this small number, that there was a, there was a high degree of inbreeding. And because of that inbreeding, it affected their reproductive potential. Because we can look at male cheetah semen. We can collect semen from males and if you compare a semen sample from a male cheetah to a lion or a domestic cat, you'll see one-tenth the concentration of sperm cells. You'll, he you'll see poor motility. You'll see all these abnormalities. And you'll think, my gosh, uh, you know, anything over 10% in a, in a human or a cow would be an indication of sterility. So how can cheetahs do this? But they do. But so he theorized that the reason why cheetahs don't breed well is because they have lower reproductive potential and that also affects infant mortality, that uh, they're going to have a, a lower resistance to diseases. Um, these are all effects from inbreeding. But we did have some success with breeding here of cheetahs. And uh, as you know, uh, over that period of time from the late 80s, let's see, I started here in 78. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be here the first year that we had a, a litter of cheetahs born. No. I didn't have anything to do with that, but, um, but that was, the, no, seriously, I didn't. Um, I just happened to be here. But I remember the day that the first litter of cheetahs were born here at the zoo. Um, we did have to intervene with that litter. Um, and we were lucky enough to have uh, about a dozen litters born during a period where there were very few zoos in the country that were breeding cheetahs. 
And I mentioned the fact that we had the Cheetah Survival Center. And that was a unique center because we dedicated a large number of enclosures to one species. And that you really didn't see done very often. So, um, and that's what was the key. The key, what we learned after doing all those studies that I mentioned that the SSP embarked on, we even had, uh, we had um, reproductive biologists that came from the National Zoo and they collected semen. I'll tell you one little story. I know I'm gonna run out of time, but um, I'll tell you one little story that uh, we had Dave Wilt and Mitch Bush, who are well-known researchers at the Smithsonian Institution uh, National Zoo, longtime friends of mine. They came, they were traveling around the country and they were collecting semen from male cheetahs. And this is where we learned some of this information that we have today. They came to St. Louis and we had about four or five males at that time. And they collected semen from these males. And we had one old male, his name was Harpo. And Harpo, they, they were able to collect the worst sample from Harpo. We had two studly looking males and they gave really good samples. And Mitch and Dave said, you need to focus on these two male cheetahs. Don't put so much time and effort into Harpo. Okay, so we're, we're, we're really looking at our two good looking handsome males. And Harpo, I don't know if I told you, he was 14 years old when we acquired him. That's at the upper end of the deal for age uh, longevity for, for cheetahs. 10 to 12 is about average age for these guys. Um, so after they left, they had they collected all their data and everything. And I remember we were making introductions with, uh, with the two big males that we had at that time, which were our two top males. Nothing, nothing happened. They weren't interested in the females. The females weren't interested in the males. We had a couple females that actually came into estrus during that period. And I remember thinking, well, we've got to try all of our males. So here we take lowly Harpo, the old man. He had never sired any offspring. We put him in with one of our females, and he actually bred that female. And he, he sired at least two litters here at the St. Louis Zoo. And I remember calling <laughs> Dave and Mitch and telling you, remember that male that you told us not to focus on so much? He said, he's our breeder now. So uh, <laughs> we don't give up on any of them. But there's so many unique things about cheetahs that are different than the other cats. Um, you know, obviously, in the, uh, around 2001, uh, we opened up River's Edge, at least the first phase, and that included a renovation of the cheetah areas. So what you see today when you walk down the path, you'll see the display yard, which is still part of the original big yard of the cheetahs. Behind that, we have still seven yards where we hold the majority of our cheetahs, where we do most of the introductions. Um, we, do, we hold most of our animals back in that area. So you don't see a lot of that that goes on behind the scenes. Um, but it's a beautiful yard, and it, and it has a lot of diversity. And our cheetahs like it. Um, the only reason that they've come out was because they were pushed out. It's not because they wanted to come out, but we have had a couple individuals that have left the cheetah yard, as you probably know. Um, <laughs> I know. We also were one of the few zoos in, the, in this country uh, in North America to display or exhibit uh, the king cheetah. You may be familiar with the king cheetah. Uh, it's not a separate subspecies. Uh, it was once named as a separate subspecies. Um, it's actually a genetic mutation. Uh, it's no different than a white tiger or a white lion. Uh, it's produced by recessive genes. Uh, it's a beautiful cat, a beautiful coat pattern. Looks a little different than the normal uh, even spotted cheetah. Uh, it has the larger blotches on the side. It has three long dorsal stripes that run down the back. Um, and there are very few zoos that have um, I'm going the wrong way here, excuse me. Um, and we were lucky enough to, um, to have uh, a litter born a couple of years ago in River's Edge, so uh, we're going to continue doing that work. Um, this is the ex situ part of our conservation program, and it's very important. Um, but we all know that when you look at the big picture, we also need to be focusing our attention on animals in the wild. So that's one of the reasons why we now have established the uh, Cheetah Center uh, and focusing our efforts in Africa. Oh, I want to tell you one last study that we started about a year ago. Uh, Dr. Sherry Asa and uh, a graduate student, Regina Mossetti, um, they uh, came to us and asked if, uh, if we could uh, use the cheetah for a mate choice um, study. And I don't know if you've read anything about mate choice uh, today, but it's uh, something uh, in the scientific community that has uh, drawn some interest. Um, 
We've started with the cheetahs. Cheetahs aren't alone. But what we believe, and there's a bit of literature out there today, that there are females, uh, female cheetahs or other female mammals, that are selecting their mates based on urine or other markers. Um, and they're choosing the males that are most distantly related, which is an interesting hypothesis. Um, and so what we did here to test that, we weren't alone. There are about half a dozen zoos in the country. We first off started collecting urine from male cheetahs. Well, how do you do that? Well, they all have certain spots. They have marking areas. Once you learn where those areas are, then we put up a device. It's a metal aluminum device. It's kind of a cone-shaped thing with a little cup at the bottom of it. So hopefully, if the male backs up to it and marks the tree like he should do, then we'll collect some of that urine. And once we have that urine, we can freeze it. And then we can ship that to other zoos. And then we introduce that urine to females, different females. And then we just start observing their behavior. We know the relationships between all of the cheetahs. So we know their pedigrees. We know how closely related they are to one another. So it's really interesting because it's still early in the results, but it is supporting their hypothesis that the female cheetahs tend to choose the males that are most distantly related. Well, why am I telling you this? The reason why this is really important, I think, we think, is that um, instead of moving an animal physically because of the SSP program, we choose these animals and they, we look at them on paper and we say, oh yeah, these are the best pairs, that maybe we can let them choose which one should be their best mate. So instead of physically moving that animal, which logistically is, is a challenge sometimes, we'll just move the urine around. And we'll see if that female likes a particular urine over another you know, animal's urine. So that's the goal. That's what we hope someday. And Sherry's also going to host uh, a meeting with a lot of other zoo people here in the near future, looking at a number of other species, not just cheetahs. This is kind of our flagship species, though. OK, we need to shift our efforts uh, and talk a little bit about cheetahs in the wild. Um, these are some of the uh, projects that we've been involved with. I'm not going to go over all these. Uh, but uh, we've, we've been very busy since, uh, since we began this program uh, some years ago. You can see some of the projects that we've been involved with here and that we've received funding for. Um, <clears throat> and these are some of our research colleagues here. Dr. Dr. Sarah Durant, uh, she actually picked up the work that Tim Carroll began in the late 70s and the early 80s. She is the chief cheetah biologist scientist in the Serengeti. Serengeti is considered the largest natural ecosystem uh, left in East Africa. So it's, a, it's an area of primary uh, um, uh, importance. And that's why I selected the Serengeti. That was the first area we started focusing our attention. Um, Sarah works very hard. Uh, she's now uh, been in charge of the cheetah program in the Serengeti for the last 17 or 18 years. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, have attended a number of workshops, uh, the Global Cheetah uh, Action Workshop, which was held in 2001, 2002 in South Africa. That was the first meeting when we convened a group of stakeholders, cheetah stakeholders. Most of them were from Africa. Uh, there were a few people invited from North America, a couple of animal managers, myself, Jack Grisham. We're fortunate because here at the zoo, we also have Jack Grisham, who is our vice president of animal collections. Uh, he is the cheetah SSP coordinator for the uh, North American cheetah population. So Jack and I work closely. We have for 25 years on a lot of these projects. <clears throat> Uh, the Tanzania Cheetah Conservation Program. Uh, this is actually started by Sarah Durant and her colleagues in the early 2000s. We didn't come into this program until several years later, after the development of our Cheetah Conservation Center here at, at our zoo. Um, but we've been supporting this work now for a number of years. And um, some of the activities include long-term demography of cheetahs, genetic management of fragmented populations. You know why that's important? Um, when we read and hear about population sizes in the wild, you'll hear that, oh, there's maybe up to 10,000, 12,000 cheetahs. I think it's more on the lower end of the number. But um, it sounds like there should be enough genetic material there for that to be a healthy genetic population. Well, that's not the case, because cheetahs are spread out throughout the African continent. There's a tiny little population in eastern Iran, Venaticus, but it doesn't amount to more than 
200 individuals, less than that. Um, but um, what, what's happening today is that since cheetahs are spread out over such a large area, and many species today, they become isolated pockets of individuals. We know why they're endangered today, because of loss of habitat, poaching, human encroachment. But it's this fragment, fragmentation that we're really concerned about because when you have these little isolated pockets of individuals, they then are vulnerable to disease epidemics, um, to uh, loss of genetic diversity. And that can be as or more detrimental than any of these other factors that will threaten animals in the wild today. That's one of the main reasons why we established the SSP programs in our zoos over 20 years ago, and we now have about 300 SSP programs. Um, the Serengeti carnivore census, it all began with the census of cheetahs, not just in Tanzania, but throughout the African continent. Because when we did the Global Cheetah uh, Action Workshop, we had all these stakeholders there. We had field researchers, we had government officials, we had wildlife authorities and so forth. What came out as the number one priority for this strategic plan was a census of animals. You can't develop a management program or an action plan without knowing how many animals you have in the population. So that became a priority for us to try to, to get some numbers on animals. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we've been doing now for many years. Cheetah-friendly viewing practices in public education and awareness, a very important part of the program. Uh, Human-cheetah conflict, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, you now know why it's important for us to, to develop uh, a cheetah census, <clears throat> to estimate numbers, monitor trends, uh, ex, uh, to assess conservation impact. This is what you have to have. And, and it's really interesting because um, after we met and we came up, we uh, developed this plan. This plan is something that you can have in hand then that you can actually give to the government authorities, to the wildlife officials, the people who actually make the decisions and can spend money for wildlife programs. And it means a lot when they see a group of people that come into a third world country like that and they develop a plan. It gives it a lot of clout. And they've actually been following our recommendations uh, in that plan, not just in Tanzania, but in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, Namibia. Uh, there is a group of countries, because there were researchers that came from all of those countries. There were about 50 or 60 of us that were at that meeting. Um, <laughs> cheetahs are difficult. They're difficult to census in the wild, and that's because they're largely non-territorial, they're mobile, uh, they form local transitory hotspots, and they're often very shy. So it's difficult to see cheetahs in the wild. <clears throat> so how do we do it? Well, we certainly use our tourist photographs. That's a very important uh, uh, technique. Um, spore counts, like to see this uh, individual who's, uh, I think that's, uh, I think it's Sarah driving that, that Land Rover, and then the, the uh, uh, Tanzanian who's sitting on the front. He actually can pick out prints on the road, and he knows the difference between a cheetah and a lion and a leopard, which is not easy to do. Um, so when he sees that, they'll stop and, um, and then you know, mark down whether that animal moved in that area. Um, sniffer dogs, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> sniffer dogs. This is really a neat program. And I learned about sniffer dogs when I was at uh, one of those early uh, meetings in South Africa in the early uh, 2000s. Um, there are people who have trained dogs. Dogs are incredible. As we all know, they have this incredible sense of smell. And they can be trained to find animal feces in the wild. And not only can they differentiate between different species, they can actually differentiate between individuals. That's pretty incredible. And we can prove that. We can confirm that. So that when the, che when the dog finds, this is a leopard tortoise. It's got to be a leopard tortoise, you know, <laughs> Africa. Um, I don't know what it is, frankly. But uh, he's on the wrong track right here. Um, but when they find that feces, they collect it, they put it into a bag, and then we send this to a lab, and they can do DNA analysis, and we can actually determine relationships between individuals using paternity testing, just like you do with humans. So we then know, we get an idea of whether that's the same animal that keeps dropping the poop all over, or if it's different animals. Um, so we use that. Um, public education and awareness. Um, 
very important uh, part of this program. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to travel to Africa to go to the Maasai Mara or the Serengeti, um, you know that when you're in that vehicle and somebody finds cheetahs, everybody goes to that spot. All the drivers want to go there. They want their clients to see those animals up close and, and personal. And the problem is that it does distract cheetahs. Um, it, it can be very difficult for cheetahs, especially if it's a mother with young, when all these vehicles convene in that area. I think the worst part of it is that it sends out a signal. The vultures, the vultures have learned that when they see a group of vehicles come together, that it, it's something that's probably that they should pay attention to. It may be a kill. So when the vultures find the kill, then who are the next ones to come in? You got the other large carnivores. They watch the vultures. They'll come in and they'll come to that kill. So that when those cheetahs make a kill, for instance, and they're really good at it, they're better than most of the other large cats. They're probably successful 40 to 50% of the time. Lions, probably 20% of the time. Um, that their prey is stolen from. And the other thing that I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but we know that how fast they are, that they can't sustain that. Uh, they're a sprinter. They, they can run five to 700 yards, but then they have to quit. They have to lay down and they have to recover. So if they're fortunate enough to kill a gazelle or whatever it is, they usually can't start eating that animal until they lay down and recover. They don't have the same, they don't have the same endurance that canids have. Canids are designed differently. They may not be quite as quick as cheetahs, but they're the long distance runners. Um, they have a, a brain cooling mechanism in their brain that, that the cheetahs don't have. So they'll overheat very quickly. So that's why they have to lay down and recover. Um, we have all kinds of ways that we get this information out. Uh, these kinds of brochures and that that have been produced by the uh, Tanzania uh, Carnivore Center in Arusha can be distributed, uh, disseminated to schools and government offices and um, uh, to whomever will read these materials. Um, they also created a couple programs that are kind of neat. Um, the one is the Cheetah Watch Campaign that um, uh, if you happen to see a cheetah, you mark it down on this farm, you send it into the carnivore center. They also have a wild dog uh, campaign. Um, and I know that my wife and my daughter, or two of my daughters are in the audience tonight and they can relate to this image right here because I've taken them on trips to Africa in the last couple of years. I've been going on a lot of trips for a lot of years, but I never really took any of my family members until recently. And <laughs> the last trip about two years ago or so, I had Karen and, and uh, Alyssa, my youngest, it was one of the rainiest periods that Kenya had seen. We were really at the end of the rainy season, but the rains continued. As we know, global weather patterns are changing all over. Um, and there were a number of times where our vehicles got stuck. This is not uncommon. Um, every day, I think all of our vehicles got stuck somewhere. This was a little bit extreme right here, but, um, but there are all kinds of challenges that when you're trying to study these animals in the wild that you have to deal with. Um, now, this program has expanded from just one of studying cheetahs and wild dogs to all carnivores in Tanzania. And this is important because there are 35 species of carnivores found in Tanzania, six of which are endangered, including the wild dogs and cheetahs. Um, and so it's really neat that, uh, that it's now a much larger program than when it began. Um, this is something that um, is probably one of the greatest challenges for us. It's not just for cheetahs. We all know that with uh, any large carnivores, you can look at, look at Bert and Ernie, our two brown bears. How did they come here to the United States? They came here, I mean, how did they come to St. Louis? Because of conflict with humans in the wild, a confrontation. So it's occurring here in, in the United States. It's happening in Africa. It's happening with animals with tigers in India. We read and hear about these kinds of problems. But you can't just go in as a biologist or a conservationist and say, oh, no, you can't cut down any more trees, you can't create more farmland, because um, you, you have to protect these areas. Well, that's difficult when you're talking about an animal that kills somebody's livelihood, that kills their livestock, or may even kill them, those people and eat them. So it's not an easy thing to do. So we have to find ways to, uh, to get people to buy into these programs um, or to educate them, there are ways that they can protect their uh, livestock from cheetahs, for instance, uh, that aren't that difficult. Um, how do we do this? Well, these are pictures of two bomas. Um, 
the Maasai Bomas. These are my two daughters right here, my two oldest daughters, Amy and Ashley. Um, but the reason why I have these two slides in here is that all Bomas are created about the same. You have your uh, cow dung huts, and then they're surrounded by a perimeter of vegetation and thorns and so forth. And one of the things that they can do is to beef up those, um, their bomas, their, their barriers. And they use more thorny vegetation. They make them wider. They make them taller. Yeah, it's a little more work, but it might keep those lions out, or it might keep those hyenas out. And it's interesting because cheetahs, because of their diurnal behavior, they're active during the day. Well, we know that they're active at night, too. Uh, not quite as nocturnal hunters as the lions and hyenas and, and leopards. But um, they oftentimes are picked as the culprit for killing uh, a calf or when, when the farmer or the, the, uh, um, the Maasai find a dead animal, they oftentimes will blame it on the cheetah because that's what they see walking around during the day. So they think, well, it's got to be the cheetah because they're out you know, during the day. They don't see a lot of the other large carnivores oftentimes. Um, that's one method. It's a no-brainer. Another one is to uh, manage your stock more closely. This happens to be a picture of Boran cattle in, in Kenya or Tanzania, that when your animals are close to, to whelping, uh, to calving, that you bring them closer to your boma or that you bring them up closer to your barn area so that you have a better control or you can watch those animals more closely. Um, that's a method. Um, now, another really neat method is something that uh, was actually uh, implemented by Laurie Marker uh, in Namibia, Southwest Africa, about 10, 12 years ago or so. She started working with Anatolian shepherds, really neat dog. They originated in Turkey, in Anatolia, uh, Turkey, and they were bred to be uh, guarding dogs. So they're really good at protecting sheep, cattle, goats. Um, this is what they do. And the animals are big. They range anywhere, females 90, males up to 150 pounds. And they will run off any animal that comes in to intimidate or threaten their, their sheep. So they're really good uh, guarders or protectors against uh, cheetahs or any other uh, carnivore that may come in to, uh, to kill the, the sheep. And I have this in here because I hope you can read it. But it has the dog names. Can you read it? What? Oh, I'm sorry. The, it has the dog names on the left side there. And I'll tell you what it says. And, and then if you look on the fourth column, it shows the losses of sheep before they brought the, the Anatolian shepherds in to start protecting their, their flocks. And then if you look at the fifth column, the one second to the uh, right, I'm sorry, I got a, I got a thing on here. Um, um, this is the one that shows um, that since the animals, since the dogs have been brought in, that you see how the losses have dropped, dropped drastically. So it's a great method for protecting your stock without having to trap and kill cheetahs. Um, the Tanzania Carnivore Program uh, actually uh, is a conglomerate. There's a group of, of different organizations that are working to make this happen. Uh, the Darwin Initiative, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York, Tairiri, that's the Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute. We work very closely with them. Um, and, and I kind of mentioned already the reason why it's important to protect these animals in the wild, but the carnivores, uh, Tanzania is a hotspot for carnivore biodiversity. Uh, and globally, there are important populations of threatened carnivores in that part of the world. Um, and I've covered some of these objectives already, why it's important for us to, to do these things and, and ultimately to create a National Action Plan for Carnivore Conservation. These are some of the staff. Um, we have other people that are working with this program. But uh, i just point out a couple few uh, of the staff. Uh, the gentleman on the far left, uh, Alex Labora, he maintains the Atlas data, uh, database. All the reported sightings of, um, of cheetahs uh, to go into a computerized network uh, at the Carnivore Center. So he's responsible for that. Um, uh, Maurice Masuha, he recently earned his PhD. And I met Morris uh, at one of the early cheetah meetings. And we realized at that time he was the director of the Tanzania Carnivore Center in Arusha, Tanzania, and realized that he was really 
uh, an important part of this program. He was the director of the program at that time, and he was pursuing his PhD, and he needed funding support. So our center, the Cheetah Conservation Center, decided to help him with his uh, PhD tuition costs at the University of London, England. So he earned his PhD uh, the early part, uh, early part of summer last summer, and now he's back at the Carnivore Center uh, doing good work. Um, and um, this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute. This building right here was built with funds from the Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute that's been doing work in that area for many, many years. But uh, they built this building. This has become the base of operations. This is where I go when I go over to Tanzania. And we start there with, with our staff. And then we travel out from that point to different research sites and so forth. Um, this is, again, Morris down here in the lower right-hand corner. Um, but it is, um, it's an area where they can do uh, training. Uh, we do educational programs. Um, and again, this is how we uh, disseminate this information. I think I have another slide right here. Um, when all this information comes in, the reported sightings that I mentioned, to date, I believe that there are 35,000 reported sightings. And that's a combined all the tourist sightings that they receive, um, all the camera trap survey work that's done. We're using a lot of camera traps. In fact, there are 400 different camera trap sites now. Um, that's a lot of camera pictures. I mean, thousands of pictures. But it's really cool because um, we're now seeing species that we didn't know were in that area. And obviously, we're finding out a little bit more about um, the abundance of these species in certain areas. <clears throat> and these are the kind of pictures that we get. That's another interesting thing, too, because uh, on one of my last trips to uh, Tanzania, we were traveling at night. And you don't expect to see tra uh, cheetahs up moving at night. But they're more nocturnal than you think. And I'm not sure if they're actually hunting at night, you know, because they have the tear lines. And the tear lines, one of the reasons why we believe that they have tear lines is that it, it either helps to um, with the sunlight, kind of like a football player when they put the, uh, the black marks under their eyes to cut the glare from the sun, or maybe a camouflage adaptation. But, but they do move at night. And we, we've seen several cheetahs moving around at night. And then we get all these other cool um, photographs of animals, the striped hyenas and small cats and leopards and so forth, civets. Even the big guys uh, <laughs> will walk through these, these camera traps. Um, Yes, and uh, these are some of the neat brochures that uh, they received. The, the Tanzania Carnivore Center produces this carnivore news bites that comes out on a quarterly basis. And you can access this information uh, by going into the website and learning about uh, what they're doing. And if you want to go in and see these atlases and see where all these animals are being sighted and, and see this distribution uh, map, you can easily do that by going in on the website. <clears throat> I had the opportunity the last time I was there in August to, uh, to give a talk. And I actually um, highlighted our partnership with the Tanzania Carnivore Center and the work that they've been doing for a number of years. Um, it was a great opportunity because I had the opportunity at that meeting to meet the Director General, who is actually in charge of all the, the, Tanzania, well, the Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute. That, they are the ones that issue the permits for any kind of research that takes place in the Serengeti or any of the other areas uh, throughout Tanzania. So that was really nice. And he, he really uh, appreciated the fact that the St. Louis Zoo has its center and that we're partnering uh, on these projects. Now, one last thing, and I'm not going to keep you here all night. But we've also expanded. The cheetahs are unique. I mentioned the fact that they're spread out throughout the African continent. It's a little different than our other how many centers do we have, Bob? 11 or 12? 12. 12, yeah. OK, we have 12 centers. Um, most of the other centers focus on an individual species or a habitat, which is really very specific. Cheetahs are different because they range throughout Africa. So what I've been trying to do over the last few years is kind of spread out a little bit. So not only are we focusing in, in Tanzania, but we're certainly, we've been partners with Laurie Marker for many years. Uh, I took the first zoo group 
to Laurie Marker's place, gosh, back in 1990, I guess it was, uh, or no longer ago than that, uh, 1980, I guess. Um, but um, no, 1990. And I took the first zoo group there, and that then has become an area where many zoo groups go there to find out what's happening there. So, you know, we now are, we were supporting projects in Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya. And so far, Jeff Bonner is letting me do it. So I think that's great. Um, this is a really neat project, Action for Cheetahs, Kenya. Uh, Mary Wickstra, she started this project a couple of years ago, about five years ago. She was a student of Laurie Marker. She left the United States. She was a zoo worker for, for a number of years up in Michigan. She left Michigan, moved to Africa. She uh, worked at Laurie's place uh, in Namibia for two years. And then she went out of Namibia. And this is what Laurie has been doing. Laurie has been training people to design and be able to uh, do their own prog uh, pro programs, similar programs to what she's been doing, these model programs in other countries. So she trained uh, Mary Wickstra, uh, Amy Dickman, uh, also is working in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, Rebecca Klein in Botswana. They were all students of Laurie Marker. And then they've gone off and developed their own programs. I've known Mary for many, many years. And I also had the opportunity to travel to visit Mary to see her program, to see if it's something we really wanted to get behind and, and start supporting. And, and I feel that it's, it's very important. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, this is her base camp. Um, this is Salama. And Salama is, I mean, she's worked in Lewa. She's worked up in Samburu. She's worked in the same areas as the Grevy zebra. And we've tried to overlap our programs. So cheetahs are found in northern Africa. So the Sahala Sahara region where Bill Houston is working with desert antelopes. Why not pool our resources when we can? So if you have researchers in the field that are looking for desert antelopes, they can just as easily keep track of the carnivores that they find. So we're working together with a lot of these projects. The Gravy Zebra program I'm sure you're familiar with is also in Kenya. Lewa, we're working in Salama. Salama is about 80 to 90 miles southeast of Nairobi, uh, kind of about halfway between Amboseli and Nairobi. So this is her base camp. It's not very big or, or it's very primitive, but it's comfortable. Um, shower facility. You know, you've got to heat up your own water if you want to shower and pour it over your head. But, um, but she's, she's expanding the size of this facility. And she wants to eventually invite uh, more researchers and eventually uh, donors and so forth to come to her program. And I'll tell you, if you ever get the opportunity to do it, um, you probably wouldn't stay there the full time. You might stay there for a couple of days because it's nice to get a you know, warm shower after about three or four days. But, but she, should, she would make sure that you do that. But um, it's really a neat area. And yes, there are camels in um, Kenya and throughout Africa. This is the vehicle that we use when I was staying there with them. Every day, we would go out to the study sites. And we would go in the morning, and we would go in the afternoon. Um, the reason why we were doing this was to set traps to catch cheetahs. And this is a trap that we use. It's kind of like a big dog trap. Um, and as bait, we use goats. So we would have to go to the local Maasai or Samburu and rent a goat from them. And they were they're very protective of their goats. So you don't let anything happen to their goat. And I don't know how many of them saw what we were doing. But if they saw this, they probably wouldn't like it. you know. But, but we didn't lose a single goat. And Mary's been doing this for some time now. So about a week before I arrived in Salama, Mary had caught a female cheetah. Um, this was a cheetah that she caught. And the reason why they do that is that they immobilize this animal, they put a radio collar on the animal, and then they can track the animal's movement. This happened to be a female that had two eight-month cubs. They estimated eight-month-old cubs with her. And the way she was caught was that one of her cubs went into the trap and was caught. And then when, the, when they came to that spot, Cosmos and Mary came to that spot, they, uh, they saw the mother and the other offspring kind of off in the distance a little bit, but they didn't want to leave the area. So what they did was they brought in a second trap and set it right next to the one with the cub. And then it wasn't long, it wasn't more than about an hour later, that the mom walked in. They didn't want the cubs. They just wanted the mother to put the collar on the mother. And so they were able to do that. Do you know that she was caught again? When I was there, I was there for about a week in Salama. Um, 
four or five days, we went out in the morning, we went out in the afternoon, because we have to go out, we have to feed the goat, we have to water the goat, we gotta check on the goat, make sure the goat's fine. <laughs> and then you gotta change the goat out every couple days, because you want a goat that doesn't just sit there, you want one that you know, makes a lot of noise. <laughs> And uh, they tried recordings, they tried recordings, but it wasn't like the real thing. The cheetahs really want the real thing. So um, she was recaught. Well, it was the morning that Mary and I went to another study site that was several hours away. So that particular morning, she got caught again. And her research assistant, Cosmos, that was in that picture before, um, he was able to, um, well, he contacted the Kenya Wildlife Service because she's working with the Kenya Wildlife Service. And, and they said to go ahead and, and just release the cheetah. And that was great because we had a chance to check her status. She looked great. She hadn't shed the collar. But the reason why I'm telling you all these things is that what's produced, what we, what we learn from this, this is a neat program. We use GPS satellite tracking. This was a program that was actually developed by Ian Douglas Hamilton, the famous elephant researcher in Kenya. Save, save the Elephants program that he started about 30, 35 years ago. He now is using these radio telemetry, these GPS collars. We are now plugged into their program. So we're using the same software that they use to track uh, elephants for cheetahs. And every one of these lines that you see on here uh, shows movement, movement of a cheetah in, in one hour. So um, if you look at this spot, right here, you see that that cheetah didn't move a whole lot. Well, that was the day that she was caught in the trap again. So she <laughs> stayed there. And um, we kind of suspected that, OK, that morning, we went in on the computer, because you can access it anytime you want. Um, Mary and I were looking in on her laptop, and she said, boy, this is interesting. This particular female, it doesn't look like she's moving. Well, we had no idea that she was in the trap. We didn't <laughs> confirm that until Cosmos traveled there and, and then saw her in the trap. But it's really neat. And what's the most significant thing about this is that the majority of cheetahs today are found in unprotected areas. They're not found in the parks, in the preserves, in the reserves. The majority of them are found in non-protected areas. So those are areas where you have most of your people living. This was an area in Salama where I, you can't believe how many people live there. And there's a mother cheetah raising two young that if left unpersecuted and, and they don't bother those animals, she's successfully raising these cubs in an area with real high livestock activity and, and human activity. So that's promising. That's very promising. Um, yeah, this is Sarah Durant, uh, a longtime uh, research partner and, uh, and one of her uh, research uh, colleagues up on top there. Um, these are the list of donors and partners that we're working with today. Uh, there are many more zoos that are part of this list. These are just some that I highlighted here. And obviously, our Tanzania partners that are, that are essential to, uh, to these programs. And we're certainly not shutting our eyes to what's happening uh, to cheetahs in the wild. Uh, we're very aware of what's happening today. And we're going to continue to work diligently to protect cheetahs um, for future generations. So, thank you, everyone. I think we have some time uh, to answer questions if, uh, yes, sir. Uh, what's your role for artificial insemination in zoo <laughs> Yes. Um, cheetahs are one of the animals that they have really focused on. And I mentioned Dave Wilt and Mitch Bush. They were the front runners, <laughs> and Joe Gale Howard. Um, they have been working with cheetah artificial insemination for years. The challenge is that Cheetahs and other big cats are not like um, cows or pigs or horses or humans. Um, they're not spontaneous ovulators. So the reason why I'm telling you that is that if you're tracking the cycle, the estrous cycle of, of a dog, for instance, or a human, you can pretty well pinpoint when that animal is ovulating. A lot of humans do that. Um, with cats, they're induced ovulators, so that cats have to breed a large number of times in a short period. They, you know, cats will breed up to, well, lions. They've been observed breeding 80 to 100 times in a day in a 24-hour period. It's the frequent breeding or coitus that causes the female to ovulate. 
that present, presents a problem because way back when, when we first, we attempted it here at the St. Louis Zoo. We're a very progressive zoo. We've tried things long before they were really perfected. I remember a snow leopard once a long time ago. We thought she was an estrus. We immobilized her. We ran her up to the hospital. We also collected semen from our male snow leopard. We ran it at the hospital. We tried to insert that semen into the back into that female because that's the way you inseminate a cow. We figured that's the way you do it. You go in there, you put it, you put it into the cervix, and, and hopefully she's going to become pregnant. It doesn't work like that. Um, the, the females, most cats, cheetahs have to be um, treated with hormones. The, the follicular stimulating hormones and the ovulating hormones and that, and it's over a week period. Um, and then if ovulation occurs, that's when the insemination has to take place. It's usually about six days after you start the treatment with these other drugs. And you don't go in through the hind end. You go in laparoscopically through the side. And then the semen's deposited laparoscopically into the fallopian tube or the uterine horn. And doing this method, which was perfected by Mitch Bush and, and Dave Wild and his team, they now have about a 60 to 70 percent success rate with cheetahs. So um, the, the problem is, and I didn't tell you this also, or maybe I did, that we know how to breed cheetahs. It's not that cheetahs have lower reproductive potential today. They can be bred naturally, but they need to be bred with a breeding center philosophy uh, that you want to put as many cheetahs as you can into a large area and then be able to do introductions on a daily basis, on a regular basis. And then hopefully you'll put together these compatible pairs and that'll result in, in breeding. Keeping cheetahs a pair here and a pair there doesn't work. And we're now learning this after 20 years of working with cheetahs that the, the facilities that have been most successful, we had success, we're still having success here because we have eight enclosures here. We can hold up to you know, 15 or more cheetahs. Uh, White Oak Plantation, Fossil Rim in Texas, uh, San Diego Wild Animal Park, uh, Winston, Oregon. They are all facilities that are designed 25 to 30 cheetahs. We don't have that many cheetahs to give everybody cheetahs, but that's the philosophy and that's the technique that works. So we can breed them. It's not that they have lower reproductive potential as Stephen O'Brien thought in those early days because they're very prolific. When Tim Carroll was tracking those female cheetahs that were losing those litters in the Serengeti back in the 80s, he saw females that would lose up to three or four litters in a year, three litters in a year, the females would recycle within a two to four week period. Mother Nature has built in that when you lose your offspring, that that female becomes fertile very quickly and she can be rebred. Well, that's not an animal with low fecundity. That's an animal that's very prolific and does very well if left alone. So that's the way we're trying to breed cheetahs now. We have some individuals in the population that um, probably are more valuable than others. Those are ones that are usually older animals that haven't reproduced that we kind of then focus on for the AI techniques. But it's mainly reserved for cats like clotted leopards. A lot of the small cat felids, a lot, a lot of the small cats, they don't breed well in, in zoos. So um, those are the ones that they focus their efforts on and, and they've really made some strides. Sorry for such a long answer, but <laughs> yes. Uh, this is a question about the speed of the animal. Ones that you're making. How, how do we know how do we know if the speed is inherent and didn't need to be learned from the parent? Because I don't guess you have the area that they go after a little 70 mile an hour run training. So do you know what my question is? I do know what your question is. So um, I don't have a real good answer for you. Um, I can tell you this though, that I I think it's inherent. And I and I say that because if you look at how cheetahs have evolved. They've evolved into a, their weight, males can weigh up to 130 pounds. It's not a small cat, but they're a small structured cat. You know what I mean? Compared to the other uh, large cats that rely on their strength and robustness to obtain their prey. Cheetahs have lost that weight and size and that ferocity for speed. So that's occurred over a long period of time. So they're designed, they are designed for speed. That's what they're designed for. I think that's inherent. Um, the other thing that people ask oftentimes when they see our animals in zoos, everybody worries about animals, well, they worry about hand-raised animals. Are they going to lose, lose the ability to hunt, or is that an instinct or not? Well, 
It's an individual thing. But most of our animals, or the ones that I've worked with over the years, um, they don't lose that ability to hunt. I think it's instinctual. Now, I've seen tiger moms, Callista, our most recent tiger mom, as soon as we started putting mom out with her five cubs, the first thing she, one of the first things she started doing was hooking pigeons. She'd hook pigeons because they came, became naive. She was inside for three months. The male tiger didn't care about pigeons, so they were roosting lower and lower. She started hooking these pigeons. She wouldn't kill them. She'd put them in her mouth. She'd bring them over and drop them in front of her kids. So this is a female who was hand-raised, one of the most people-imprinted cats that I've ever worked with, tigers that I've worked with at Big Cat Country. And she did not lose that instinct. And she's one of the best mother tigers I've ever had. So it, they're all individuals, just like us. Some make better moms than other ones. But, um, but um, um, they don't lose their ability to hunt. And all of our cats will make kills on a routine basis. They'll kill birds and squirrels and rabbits and pigeons. And you tell us about it. Whenever you find them, a lot of times you'll see it first. And um, questions? Yes. My question is, how do you communicate with the natives? Do they speak English or do you speak? My Swahili is not very good. I just know a few words. Fortunately, the people in that part of the world, um, their, uh, their universal language is Swahili. It doesn't matter where you go to in Africa, most of them speak some form of Swahili. Um, but their official language is um, English and they have oftentimes their own tribal dialects. So these people know three, really three different languages. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you go there, you think, my gosh, you know, you think of our education system, but yet how, how much more they know than we do in, in, some, in some cases. Um, so there's really no problem, except for the time that Karen and Alyssa were at our eco camp in the Serengeti and, um, excuse me, it wasn't, it was a Masai Mara. <laughs> Do I have time to tell you this story? <laughs> and it was, uh, it was late in the evening, and we had a generator, because we do, when you're at an eco camp, uh, there's, you don't have permanent electricity, you don't have permanent water, everything's brought in, and everything's taken out. Once the camp is shut down, everything that's brought in gets removed. Um, and on one evening, I wanted to go back and read a little bit before they turn the lights out. They turn the lights out at 10 o'clock. Karen and Alyssa decided to stop at one of the tents to play cards with one of the other girls in the group that they became friends with. I told them, make sure you come back to the camp um, before 10 o'clock, because that's when they shut the lights out, and you don't want to be walking around. There's no fences or anything. You're out there amongst the, the lions and hyenas and everything else, and I know a little bit about their behavior. So I fell asleep. I wake up in my cot. I roll over. I look at my watch. It's midnight. And I turn on my flashlight, and I see that Karen and Alyssa didn't come back to the tent. And I'm thinking, this is not right. They're not back at the tent. They need to be back at the tent. So the plan was that you step outside your tent. You don't walk back to the dining camp. We were situated at the tent that was far. I always positioned myself at the farthest away from, from the main dining area. So there was a long walk to get there. And I'm waving my flashlight. That was the rule. And the Maasai who spend the night outside, they're supposed to look for the flashlights and then come to help you if there's a problem. It's better to walk in a group. Well, nobody sees me. It's now after 12 o'clock, and I'm waving the flashlight, and I'm thinking, OK, I'm not waiting here, because I don't know if they were kidnapped by uh, somebody that came, Somalians or whatever, or <laughs> if they were picked off by hyenas or lions. And this is not funny. These are things that were running through my head. So I go walking down the path, and it's a long path, and I get down to the main dining area. Everything's dark. Everything's quiet. And I'm passing these tents along the way. I don't remember which one it is. It's pitch dark. I don't know which one they're in. I kind of thought I knew which one it was. I walk up to the tent. There's somebody snoring in the tent. And I'm thinking, I can't, I can't wake these people up. So I go down to the thing. I'm now calling for the Maasai. Nobody comes out. Well, I'm making a long story out of this. I walk back to my tent. I walk back to the dining. Now I'm yelling. I'm yelling for the Maasai. Three of them come running out. They're all upset and everything. And I'm trying to tell them in Swahili that my wife didn't come back to the tent. And one of them, they didn't know any English at all. These guys didn't. And um, so they're pointing to one of the tents. And I go, so my wife's in the tent? And they, he's pointing to the tent, yes. And so we go up to the tent where the snoring was. And sure enough, I call into the tent. And Karen wakes up and she goes, yeah, we're in here. 
I go, why didn't you come home? You didn't come home to the tent. And she said, because the Maasai wouldn't let us. There was a group of lions that made a kill. They had killed, um, I think it was an eland. They had killed an eland. And what woke me up was a group of hyenas. A larger group of, lion, of hyenas came and displaced the lions. A group of about 35 hyenas came in and ran off the lions. I heard them all, you know, calling and roaring and all that stuff. So that's what woke me up. And I knew they were close by. So they had actually come right through our camp. And when the Maasai saw the lions come through camp, they said, there's no way. It's too dangerous for you to walk back to the tent. But Karen, I think, had tried to communicate to them, said, you got to go tell my husband, because you know he's waiting for us to come back to the tent. Well, I didn't know that. So um, I said, well, I'm taking them back to the tent. So we all whacked back, walked back to the tent. And the next morning, we found the story. And I saw the lion prints on the path. And I'm thinking, here, boy, it shows how smart I am. I'm walking around up and down this path. There's lions all over the place. They can see a heck of a lot better than we can at night. So we did travel that next morning. We found the kill site. The vultures were on it at that time. It had been picked clean by that point. Then we traveled up a hill. It wasn't very far from where our camp was. And we found all the lions. And uh, so they got to see that. So that was kind of cool. Do we have time for any more questions? One more. Anything else? Yes. It's strictly time. We're measuring time. So if that female spends more time, and there's a lot of variables. I'll admit, there are variables that we try not to make the, the device or whatever we, when we introduce the urine, we put that in there several days in advance. So those females have a chance to see that. It's not a novel object, because you never know. You know, you, if they see something for the first time, some animals will go over and play with it, some won't. Um, but it's strictly the amount of time that's measured that they spend because some animals won't spend any time there at all. You know, they'll go over, they might check it, and then they just move away. It's the females that are spending the most time on that spot. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Um, and if